The mono you're about to see is a construct of fact and fantasy. But relax, weigh the facts, and enjoy the pretense. Our pachuco realities will only make sense if you grasp their stylization. It was a secret fantasy of every vato, living in or out of the pachucada, to put on the suit suit and play the myth. Mas chucote que la chingada. Pues órale. than any other segment of our society. It's terribly unfair and very unreasonable and uh, very, very unjust. And these people have suffered tremendously. What is it that your mind was looking for? Where is your heart? For this you give your heart to everything? You are destroying your heart. On this earth, you suppose that you can ever go in search of anything and find it? America, find your heart. A moment for those viewers who may have just begun uh, watching, let me tell you that Senator Robert Kennedy was shot tonight. He went to the Ambassador Hotel ballroom to speak to his uh, supporters in the California primary campaign and declare victory. Uneducated, he needs to stay in school. He lacks ambition. He needs to think American. 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 God is America. God is America.
Ladies and gentlemen, the mono you're about to see is a construct of fact and fantasy. But relax, weigh the facts, and enjoy the pretense. Our pachuco realities will only make sense if you grasp their stylization. It was a secret fantasy of every vato, living in or out of the pachucada, to put on the suit suit and play the myth. Mas chucote que la chingada. Pues órale. We adopted a method of nonviolence. We expect violence against us. This is, uh, if we're effective, there's going to be that violence, but we're not going to let that deter us. The fact is that we haven't done that, and the, the result has been that the farm workers have suffered, and they've suffered and uh, grown much more slowly economically than any other segment of our society. It's terribly unfair and very unreasonable and uh, very, very unjust, and these people have suffered tremendously. What is it that your mind was looking for? Where is your heart? For this you give your heart to everything? You are destroying your heart. On this earth, do you suppose that you could ever go in search of anything and find it? America, find your heart. For those viewers who may have just begun uh, watching, let me tell you that Senator Robert Kennedy was shot tonight. He went to the Ambassador Hotel ballroom to speak to his uh, supporters in the California primary campaign and declare victory of the moment of Give me up in the name. Uneducated, he needs to stay in school. He lacks ambition. He needs to think American. 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 God bless America. God bless America. God bless
There I am. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I want to do also a shout out to our uh, viewers and um, wonderful attendees online and out in cyberspace. Know that we have a lot of beautiful um, uh, spirits and souls that are all in uh, solidarity with us and communication and just spending time with us uh, here this afternoon, uh, vibrating with us in a moment with Luis Valdez and uh, Dr. Jorge Huerta. Uh, my name is Robert Castro. I am a professor of theater and dance here at UC San Diego, and I'm also the current director of the Chicanx and Latinx Studies minor program. Yes. <laughs> really thrilled about that, for sure. Um, I want to just have a couple things I want to say, and then I'll uh, hand it over to our moderator this evening, uh, Dr. Jade Powers Sotomayor. Uh, so tonight's evening is The Vibrant Being, Luis Valdez in conversation with Dr. Jorge Huerta. Uh, it's truly a celebration event that we're um, presenting this evening on the publication of Luis's book, finally, <laughs> uh, titled Theater of the Sphere, The Vibrant Being, something that we've been waiting for many years and thrilled that we actually have for the world to share and experience and to uh, live and, uh, and uh, actually put into concrete action uh, and the spirit of Luis. Thank you. Um, also, I want to acknowledge that tonight's event is also part of a month-long celebration here on campus at UC San Diego, celebrating the legacy and the social justice work of the great Cesar Chavez. Yes. Uh, one final note before I get more official uh, describing and sharing the, the co-sponsors and introducing Jade. I just want to do a, a land acknowledgement uh, for the Kumaye uh, peoples. The UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university was built on the unceded territory of the Kumaye Nation. Today, the Kumaye people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge the tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship. Again, today's uh, event is hosted by the UC San Diego Chicanx Latinx Studies Program, Department of Theater and Dance. Co-sponsors are Latin American Studies, Institute of the Americas, Latinx Chicanx Academic Excellence Initiative, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, the Chicanx Latinx Alumni Council, Department of Ethnic Studies, UC San Diego International Institute, Thurgood Marshall College, UC San Diego Library, the Qualcomm Institute, and UC San Diego Institute of Arts and Humanities. Without further ado, I will now introduce our esteemed uh, moderator for this evening, uh, Dr. Jade Power Sotomayor. <laughs> Jade is an assistant professor in the Department of Theater and Dance. Her research engages with discourses of embodiment and embodied practices of remembering and creating community through Latinx performance practices. Other interests include dance studies, nightlife, eco-dramaturgies, epistemologies of the body, feminism of color critique, bilingualism. Dr. Power Sotomayor is currently working on a monograph called Habla, Speaking Bodies in Latinx Dance and Performance. Her writing has been published in a variety of journals and books and has received awards from the Dance Studies Association, the American Society of Theater Research, and most recently from the American Studies Association. Dr. Power Sotomayor also works as a dramaturg and co-directs and performs with the San Diego group Bomba Liberté. She is grateful to her many teachers and students for gifting her a lifelong experience of learning. Jade, we're in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, dear Robert, and um, thank you everyone for being here. And to the maestros that I am here to be in conversation with, it is a great honor. And also just to recognize um, the generations and how, uh, as I say, we all stand as links in a chain, right? These are my maestros. I have my students who will someday be someone else's or already are someone else's maestras and maestros. So thank you for joining us today. Professor Emeritus, Dr. Jorge Huerta, who I want, it's not in his bio, but I want everyone to know was the first Chicano to get his PhD in theater. <laughs> Holds the Chancellor's Associates Endowed Chair. He is a leading authority on contemporary Chicana, Chicano, and US Latino theater, as well as a professional director. He has published a number of articles, edited three anthologies of plays, and written the landmark books, Chicano Theater, Themes and Forms, Chicano Drama, Performance Society, and Myth. 
Dr. Huerta has also directed in theaters across the country, including San Diego Repertory, Seattle's Group Theater, Washington, D.C.'s Gala Hispanic Theater, La Compañía de Teatro de Albuquerque, and New York's Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. Huerta has lectured and conducted workshops in Chicano theater throughout the U.S., Latin America, and Western Europe. In 2007, Huerta was honored for the Association of Theater and Higher Education for Lifetime Achievement in Educational Theater, Distinguished Scholar, uh, awarded the Latino Spirit Award by the California State Assembly for Outstanding Achievement in Theater Arts, and recognized for outstanding contributions to education upon his retirement by the California State Legislature. And he mentored me through a master's and a PhD. <laughs> and, if you're, and, and if you're ever close to him, that mijo or that mija will, will um, give you life for a long time. <laughs> Luis Valdez. Okay. <laughs> is regarded as one of the most important and influential American playwrights living today. His internationally renowned and Obie Award winning theater company, El Teatro Campesino, The Farm Workers Theater, was founded by Luis in, in 1965 in the heat of the United Farm Workers struggle and the Great Delano Grape Strike in California's Central Valley. His involvement with Cesar Chavez, the UFW, and the early Chicano movement left an indelible mark that remains embodied in all his work even after he left the UFW in 1967. His early actos, Las Dos Caras del Patroncito, and Quinta Temporada, short plays written to encourage campesinos to leave the fields and join the UFW gay unions. His mitos, mythic plays, Bernabe and La Carpa de los Rascuaches gave Chicanos their own contemporary mythology. His examinations of Chicano urban life, and I don't have to show you no stinking badges. His Chicano revisioning of classic Mexican folk tales, corridos. His exploration of his indigenous yaqui roots in mummified deer. And of course, the play that re-examines the Sleepy Lagoon trial of 1942 and the Zoot Suit Riots of 1943, two of the darkest moments in LA urban history, Zoot Suit, considered a masterpiece of the American theater as well as the first Chicano play on Broadway and the first Chicano major feature film. In 2014, Luis's play, Valley of the Heart, had its world premiere on the stage of El Teatro Campesino in rural San Juan Bautista. Luis's numerous feature films and television credits include, among others, La Bamba, yes, <laughs> Cisco Kid, starring uh, Jimmy Smith and Cheech Marin, and Corri Corridos, Tales of Passion and Revolution, starring Linda Ronstad. Luis has never strayed far from his own farm worker roots. Que viva los trabajadores y las trabajadoras, right? His company, El Teatro Campesino, is located 60 miles of south of San Jose in the rural community of San Juan Bautista, California. This theater, tucked away in San Benito County, is the most important and longest running Chicano theater in the United States. Luis's hard work and long creative career have won him countless awards. There are many, I'm not gonna list them all because let's get to talking, but there's a lot. As an educator, he's taught at a lot of places. He's also received, he's also received an honorary doctorate from many, uh, from, from several places. Mr. Valdez was inducted into the College of Fellows of the American Theater at Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC. And in 2007, he was awarded a Rockefeller Fellowship as one of the 50 US artists so honored across the United States. And we are so honored to have you join us today. Por favor, please join me up here, maestros. Walter Stanton. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we made it to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, so today's event, as you know, is um, part of a series that's called Moving in the World, Performing and Theorizing Social Change. And it's also to celebrate the publication of the book in which you, Mr. Valdez, outline your trajectory as an activist and an artist from a childhood working with your family in the farms of Central California to your work in the fields alongside Cesar Chavez as a theater maker to the development of your company's unique philosophy and aesthetics. 
In the introduction to the book, Dr. Huerta, you engage with the legacy of the many projects that would follow these early days, and you have written extensively elsewhere about the legacy of the Chicano theater movement that in many ways modeled itself after Teatro Campesino's work. Mr. Valdez, what is the vibrant being, <laughs> and how do you use this concept to create work and to train artists? How is this concept inspired by the political imperatives of the Chicano movement? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Vi uh, vibrant, the vibrant being is a direct translation of a Mayan concept, uh, a word called winik vil. Winik is uh, root, vibrating root of the universe. Winik is the root, and lil is the vibration. Winik lil the vibrating root of the universe. That's a human being. A winik, halash winik, was a true human being in the Mayan concept. And so uh, I took that vibrant being as the essential corazón, the heart of a whole philosophy, a whole way of life. Now the way that it attaches to my political activity as a farm worker is uh, in another word, uh, that's in the book. These are things that are, I'm speaking about, concepts that are in the book, the theater, the sphere, the vibrant being. The other word is menya, mm -hmm. which is the Mayan word for work. That's a critical definition because menya means work in Maya Yucateco, but it breaks down into two words, men and ya. Men means creer, crear, hacer. If you create something, it's because you believe something. If you believe something, then you can do something. So belief, action, creativity, they're all motivated by the same current. And then uh, ya is another word that means love and pain. So to believe, to create, to do with love and pain is the Mayan definition of work. And by inference then, menya defines who a worker is. What is a worker? Who are the workers in human civilization? We're all workers. Now, opposed to this is a modern definition that's more part of uh, the oppressive, imperialistic, uh, top-down approach to human labor. And farm worker is a key uh, distillation of this concept. I was born uh, into a migrant farm working family, but I was never comfortable with the idea of being a farm worker, which I learned early on is basically a wage slave. A worker is part of an industrial setup, as opposed to campesino. Campesino is a person that, or campesina for all of that, is a person who lives in the country in relation to the earth a person who works the earth is a campesino or campesina. And that's a whole different definition of a human being. That is much closer to the original idea of menya. So my whole political trajectory, even starting with my involvement in the United Farm Workers, which I still support, is, that, is to expand the concept of what a worker is. A worker is a human being. A worker is a creator. A worker is a sacred being in the final analysis. And this is what Cesar Chavez, I think, through his life and his sacrifice, was trying to uh, illustrate for the world. He was acting it out through his fasts and through his person and through his philosophy. He said, we're more than wage slaves. We're more than mano de obra. We're full spiritual human beings with all this God-given potential. Mm. And that's the basis <laughs> of my <laughs> That's beautiful, thank you so much. Dr. Huerta and Mr. Valdez, if you wish, how do you see Chicano, Chicanex theater performing and theorizing social change? You've talked about, you've mentioned that, right? In, in how, we, how it can change, how we even perceive of what work is. How do, you, how do you conceive of, um, Dr. Huerta, this, this uh, potential to perform and theorize social change? Yeah, uh, it's all theory. It's all, it's, it's, 
It's about knowing what's going on. It's about understanding the issues, about facing the issues, understanding what the oppressor thinks, being able to therefore criticize and satirize the oppressor in order to make the work pleasurable. <laughs> Theater, you know, early on in the classic sense, in the Euro, the Greco, European theories of theater was to perform, to educate, more so to educate than to entertain. And education was very, very important, but to the campesino, teatro, teatro campesino, it was about educating, yes, and entertaining, because Luis said it. He said, we have to have some humor in the tragedy that we are surrounded by with what he was suffering along with the other farm workers. They were threatened with their lives by goons, you know, hired by the, the farmers and the, and the teamsters practically shooting at them. They had some very, very difficult times, and so they had to think about menya, you know, the work, the work. So in terms of theory, I'm, I'm, I'm a historian. Um, years ago, I was lecturing, and I said that I was here to talk about Chicano theater history, and the stu some a student in the, in the room said, you are Chicano theater history. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. And that was not yesterday. <laughs> So I knocked him down, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, and so I thought about that, you know, but the whole notion of I am a historian who has had documented what was happening while it was happening. A historian generally goes into the books, goes into the libraries to find stuff out. And so that was my challenge to, to find out, you know, what is this thing uh, the called Chicano Theater that I have seen his performance, his group in 1968. And so am I answering your question? Theory, theory is, it's, I'm not a theoretician, but we are surrounded by theory. And theory can be very important. And this book is the first theory book that I began to understand. Well, that makes a lot of sense, actually, because, because theorizing what we conceive of as theorizing <laughs> is sometimes something that happens in books. But theorizing, you're theorizing when you are putting your hands into the earth, right? Um, you're theorizing when you're standing up on the stage. You're theorizing right now. You're talking story. So theory perhaps is something we think of as more separate than it actually is. Mm -hmm. I want you to dig into your memories a little bit because this is such a special opportunity to have um, you here. In the book, you both reference your distinct trajectories into theater making and embodied storytelling. Can you share with us your first memory of live theater and or live performance? as an audience member or as a performer? Well, yeah, no, for me, it's, it's very direct. It was probably El Circo Escalante. Uh, in the 1940s, there was a family in Los Angeles, Los Escalantes, and they had a circus. They had a family circus. And uh, uh, the father was a ringmaster, you know, and, and the mother was a bookkeeper, and the children were acrobats and clowns, and they were all rust about. They, 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 put up their own tent and, and packed it away. And in, in the Depression, in the late 30s, uh, when they couldn't find an audience to pay, they worked in the fields. And, and I saw them in the mid-40s, the late 40s, uh, 46, 47, in, in the Delano area. They came to Delano. And uh, it, it inspired the hell out of me without my even knowing it. <laughs> because for one, circus got to me, these clowns. But they were a Mexican circus. That really blew my mind. And I thought, wow, and, and then if they can't find enough people to pay, they work in the fields, which I'm already doing. So <laughs> hey, this is, uh, it, the initial seed for El Teatro Campesino came from my watching El Circo Escalante. But inside of that is also the fact that they had clowns and that they were funny. They were funny in a carpa style. You know, and, and again, the carpa tradition in Mexico is very, very important. And again, the, the, the longer that I go into the subject matter of indigenous America, the more I realize that we've been too damn serious about uh, the Aztecs and the Mayans, you know? I mean, they're, they're like being serious about the Greeks and the Romans, you know, but they, they used to write graffiti, the Romans, you know, on the wall and uh, <laughs> the testicles and stuff that they would draw, you know? And because they were funny. It's Italian culture, you know? And the Greeks are the same way. They, they're funny. Mesoamerica was no different. <laughs> I realized, what the hell? The genius of Mesoamerica is their sense of humor. It is our sense of humor that allows us to survive. And you, we look at the pyramids, we look at the, what remains, and, and we look at the artifacts that remain, and we think this is all serious stuff. 
and, and we buy the lie that it was all about human sacrifice and all, all that bullshit, you know. But the fact is that they were a civilization that lived life the way all civilizations have lived life. And they laughed and they cried and they made love and they painted and they sang and they had ceremonies. All of that was going on in Mesoamerica before the coming of the rest of the world here. And so we've lost touch with that consciously, but in our culture, it's there in Cantinflas. <laughs> it's there in Tintan. It's there in Viruta y Capulina. It's there in, in Chisperito, you know, Chis, Chis, uh, Chispirito, yeah. It, and our comedians, our comedians are a reflection of our deepest psychological state. And so uh, uh, I think of actors like, you know, Alfonso Bedoya, you know who he is? I don't have to show you no stinking badgers, that guy. You've seen him in all kinds of movies. Uh, uh, he died uh, some time ago, but he had a career in Hollywood. On the strength of his face, he had a yucky face, you know. And, and, and just the way that he smiled could make you laugh <laughs> because he was a pelado, man. This guy was a pelado. Now, uh, uh, to American eyes, to Anglo eyes, he looked like a stereotype. But to the raza, you see something else. If you look at his movies, no, there's, there's a, I, I saw tío y la tía, you know. There's just something basic happening here. And a lot of people don't know that Cesar Chavez, among other people, had a tremendous sense of humor. You know, he used to tell jokes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I knew him when he was still smoked, you know, and, and he's, he, he, ate, he ate red meat, you know, when I met him. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he still drank, actually, had an occasional drink. Uh, but the fact is that his sense of humor was what kept him going. And so when I think about what it is about our people and how we sustain the struggle is we have to take the totality of our being and you have to make, make fun of the tragedy in life in order to overcome it. So El Teatro Campesino came together by making the strikers laugh in the darkest moments of the strike. That first winter was terrible. We were, we were starving. There was no food. But El Teatro was able to go out there in rags and make people laugh. And I realized that's our strength our ability to be able to laugh at ourselves and to survive another day. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, of people who can't let two minutes go by without making a joke, Dr. Huerta, um, <laughs> do you, can, do you, what is your first memory? Now that is a tough act to follow, you know that, and, uh, <laughs> because it is so real, but it's based on the human nature. It's based on human nature. I've been trying to write a book on comedy in Chicano theater, which I, t I started it years and years ago, and it was going to be called Comedy in Chicano Theater, Who's Laughing Now? Uh, and who is laughing now, you know? I, I love the concept. <laughs> I just have to write it. But the idea, <laughs> the idea is that comedy is universal. We all laugh. We all cry. I cried until I laughed, and I laughed until I cried. And one should never stop laughing, and one should never stop crying. But going back to what, I've, what influenced me to go into performance was my own family. My father was a professional mariachi. How more Mexican could you be? <laughs> <laughs> so I was born into it. I was born into a family of, of, of my sister and my older sisters went to college in the 40s. No Mexicans in our state were going to college in the 40s, but my sisters were. So we had a lot of touch with education and the educational process and culture. And I and my, my nieces and nephews would put on plays. We did it as performers and as an audience. We performed for our family, for the adults, and they loved it. We were all terrible. Uh, <laughs> but they loved it because it was the squinkless, you know. We were so, oh, look at how talented they are now. Go do the dishes. <laughs> but we had, that's how we started, right? You know, right. Uh, that's how we started, performing in our own backyard. I love the idea that of performing for yourselves, right? <laughs> Being both performer and, and audience member. You know, that I need to add that uh, in Delano, when we started, uh, the campesinos really had no notion of theater. They, they weren't middle class people. They, they weren't even that educated, you know? They were campesinos. And so, and there were no theaters in the villages in, in, in Mexico, aside from La Pastorela, maybe. But the, the thing is that uh, they looked at us and they, they didn't know what we were, you know? We were idiots, you know? Uh, but the thing is that um, we made them laugh. And so uh, they called us the circo. Mm -hmm. and, and the actors, the word that they had for us was payasos. Mm -hmm. You were payasos. Which meant that a lot of campesinos would not let their wives, daughters, sisters, mothers perform with a teatro campesino. These are payasos, you know <laughs> what I mean? 
and, and we can't have our women going out there making, being comedians. And so that, that limited our reach w at that, while we were in, in Delano. Once we were out and, and essentially uh, became the Chicano movement, it, it, uh, it was different. And uh, the first college-educated Chicana to join uh, is still here. It's uh, Lupe Trujillo, my wife of 54 <laughs> years. <I> mean, <laughs> Ooh, uh, we met on the march to Sacramento and, and in 66, and, and she, she comes from a solid campesino family. And she, uh, you know, her mother and father uh, had a great sense of humor. They, they loved the teatro. So anyway, they, they, when w the night that we proposed, we took her to see, uh, I, I proposed to my suegro. Um, we, we took him to see the Bar Barnum and Bailey Circus in Fresno. <laughs> 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 It was totally by accident, but anyway, it was <laughs> <laughs> very appropriate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> de circo en circo. <laughs> uh, Mr. Valdez, before becoming a playwright, director, and theater maker, you began your studies as a math and physics major. Ah. Dr. Huerta, as you know, UCSD is a STEM-focused <coughs> campus, and there are sometimes institutional divides across our various areas of study that prevent us from thinking and learning across the arts and the sciences. The work of Theater of the Sphere draws on indigenous philosophies that categorically refuse the distinctions between scientific thought and embodiment as knowledge making. In what ways do you think our institutions, artistic and academic, can benefit from this perspective? I'll let you answer first. I got a longer answer after that. You got a longer okay. answer. <laughs> You know, there, there's a lot of that in the book and the whole notion of, you know, what is science. When I got to this campus in 1975 as a young assistant professor, my wife Ginger and my two sons, um, it, was an all, it was totally science. There were five men on campus undergrad to every young woman, five to one. It was science, and science at that time, 1975, that whole period was all male, male, male dominated. And so we've come a long way from that time you know, where now we actually have a higher percentage of undergraduate women a in colleges across the country than men. And, you know, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily correct. However, this has to do with the idea of a university being only for science. The theater department and the visual arts, si si the visual arts and the music and the theater department were founded in the early 70s. And they were founded by scientists who understood the value of culture. They understood the value of music. They brought in far out musicians, far out perform, uh, visual artists, and, and not so far out theater people because the theater department was more basically, unfortunately or fortunately, ba aimed at the profession, professional theater. We're gonna have an MFA and train people to work in the professional theater, which at that time meant mainstream, read, Anglo dominated mainstream theater. But nonetheless, I, I value the, the contributions of the scientists who did that. Early on, I had a brother-in-law who was in medical school, and he brought home a medical journal, and it had the art by medical doctors. They still do. Have you ever seen this? Doctors, a lot of them, I mean, we, we are all artists. Mm, there you go. Yeah. We are all artists. We just have to draw it out of you. And what is that? It's the child in us. The child in us is the creative thought. I learned from this man, and I can remember when you said it, and who, what indigenous uh, uh, group it was, but that inside every one of us are seven beings, a little boy, a little girl, a man, a woman, an old man, and an old woman. And the seventh that balances the other six is the great spirit, or God, or whatever you call it. And so I will t say to my actors, well, at this time you're acting like a little girl. At this time you're acting like an old man. King Lear goes through all those phases. He starts out as a king and he ends up as a child. Uh, and we do that, you know, you're acting this and you're acting like that. Not to say that all kids, but children, if we look for the positive and what it is to be a child, is watch them create. Watch them create. It's, it's, a, it's a marvel, and that's what we all try to get, and I think that's what your book helps us do, is to get into that human being inside of us at all levels of age. Good, good. Yeah, it, uh, you know, I, I was a math major. I love mathematics, <laughs> and I love physics. And I, I was going to uh, become a physicist. Uh, but it, there were some, some restrictions for me right away. I, I found right away in the engineering department that there was a lot of racism. 
and I hated it. And uh, it, it, they couldn't beat me when it, it was a matter of taking a, a quiz, you know, a test, you know, and getting a 10. I got 10s every day. But I, I, that didn't change the color of my skin. So I, I, I figured I was running straight into a wall and I needed to go someplace else that, that, that where I could open up some things. But I never left uh, science behind. I still believe in science, believe in engineering. And, and I think that we need to have a scientific understanding. Uh, I realize there are a lot of Chicanitos and a lot of African Americans that, uh, that are alienated by that concept because they think it's white culture but uh, they don't know their own ancestors. They don't know where they come from. They don't know that they come from mathematicians. They come from architects. They, they, they come from scientists that understood the stars and, and uh, the wobble in the earth. They, our ancestors knew that. And uh, you know, if you're a mathematician, you know one of the first things you learn as a child is the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Okay, so look at San Juan Teotihuacan which is being newly identified as the original Tula, which is the center of Toltec civilization. Mm -hmm. And what you see in, in those pyramids and, and in those platforms that they created are a lot of straight lines and angles and uh, a lot of ingenuity and a lot of engineering because they had hydraulic systems. Mm -hmm. They had flush toilets in some of those places. This is in the time of Christ. But racism has kept the world from truly understanding what went on there. They think, okay, the pyramids were cutting out hearts, which is asinine. So I'm going to ask for the first, uh, Steve, the first slide. Uh, it's in the book. And what you see here are the two calendars. This is in the book, and I explain it. The two calendars that dictate uh, a lot of things that identify what's going on in the universe. Uh, this is the solar calendar, the big one here, the HOB, the 365-day solar calendar. And this is all mine stuff. And then the smaller calendar is a 260-day calendar. And uh, they latch together, and they come together and repeat the same sig signals every 52 years, which is the Mayan century. You know, every 52 years, it's a cycle. What's interesting about the 260-day calendar is that 260 days roughly translates into nine months. So it is the calendar of birth and death, actually. It, it's the calendar that identifies your, human, your humanness in connection to the solar calendar, which, of course, is the solar system. Now, they were able to ratchet them together and to be able to identify aspects of the world because of the interlocking two calendars. And the Tzolkin, which is the sacred calendar, is the basis of the 20-day signs. And it, they also become then markers in, in, in our life and in our progression as human beings. What's interesting, if you know about Fibonacci numbers, I, I don't know if you know the magic numbers of uh, Leonardo Fibonacci, uh, the progression. Uh, it, it, this kind of begins to link that aspect of it to the world, but it's the, the mean, the natural, the golden mean, you know, which defines uh, the caracoles in the sea, you know, the pine cones, uh, the circling of the planets, all of that is was identified by Fibonacci back in the 17th century, but the Mayans did it uh, 2,000 years uh, ago, a long time ago. And anyway, they're calendars. They're two matching calendars. The two calendars then uh, speak to that. Now, go to the book. <laughs> I recommend that you get the book and you can see <laughs> some details about how this, this uh, translates into human action. The next slide, please. Okay, these are the two calendars with their appropriate uh, glyphs, the Tolkien and the Hab. And uh, I must say, these were all hand-drawn, hand-drawn uh, based on research. And you learn to draw Mayan images rather than copy them. You learn because it's, it's artistic. It's artistic at the same time that it's mathematical. And these were drawn by uh, none other than my son, Joaquin Valdez. Mm -hmm. Right here, stand. Give me a hand. <laughs> <laughs> 
because he's been studying it too since he was a, a child. You know, my sons have gotten into it because I was into it. But the, the fact is that these are drawn with a sense of, of what they mean. And over here you have the Tzolkin, and over here you have the Chav, and I concentrate on the on the sacred calendar because that's the one that relates to human behavior. Okay, go to the next one, please. <laughs> and what happened here is that the 20 days of the Tzolkin, the Mayan sacred calendar, the 13 months of 20 days each is 260 days. So this is like the nine months. And these are the signs. Imish ik akbal kanchikchan, kimi manik lamat muluk ok, chuen eben ishmen, kib kaban esnab kawak. In other words, there are four columns of five signs each. And in five, in the Mayan calendar, in the Mayan mathematics, was a straight line. And so if you get a straight line, straight line, straight, four lines, they form a square inside a circle. That's the image of, of God. That's, that's hunabku. And so uh, I went further, one step further. Go another slide, please. And I, I broke them down. The 20 pasos, the 20 footsteps of the creator, zero is hell, or me, or lub, in, in, in the Mayan dialects. But zero is hell, like gel, like egg. That's zero. And, and the four columns are imishi, kakbaki, except here they're identified, the first five are identified with the body and with motion. So imish ikakbal kanchikchan, the second column is the heart. Kimi manik lamat muluk ok, emotion. The mind, chuen eben ishmen, and then the spirit. Kib kaban esnap kawak ahau. Imish, it's one. Imish is the dot inside your, it's your heart, actually. It's your heart. It's, it's the zygote inside the mother's womb. They, they, they defined it as the beginning of life, uh, uh, a water lily is the image, mm. but, but actually it's one. And eat is two, that's breath, breathe in, breathe out. It's up and down, it's left and right, it's movement. And once you begin to activate one and two, you go to three, akbal, three, like H2O. <laughs> that's three, two hydrogen atoms, one atom of oxygen. That's three atoms, okay? Unless you be born of water, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. People think in the Christian world that means baptism. Not just that. It means you have to learn to flow like water. So this is where dance comes in. This is where dance is part of your expression. And if you do this enough, you can continue to do this. I'm almost 82. All right. I'm also short, so that helps you. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is that these movements I began to do early on as a campesino. Okay, you can't work in the fields hmm. unless you make contact with your body. And the unacknowledged truth about campesinos, men and women, children, that are out there working in the fields in the hot sun and in the cold, is that they have some relationship to their bodies. Now, their bodies wear out, but there's tremendous strength in campesinos. There's tremendous humor and spiritual strength in campesinos that I saw for my own self in the Huelga in Delano. People weren't crying, they were laughing. They were struggling. And so let's acknowledge that power in our people, as humble as they may be. But all of this relates then to a progression, and, and what we've got then is the exercises that are described in the book. The Vibrant Being Workshop goes through the 20 steps. And what happens here is that Aristotle designed the three rules of tragedy, of classic Greek drama, as uh, logos, pathos, logos, and ethos. Now, pathos is the heart. Logos is the mind. Ethos is your morality. What he didn't put in there is eros, which Carl Jung later added, because that has to do with the body, eros. So the physicality here of the body, the motion, this is, this is eros, pathos, 
logos, ethos. Now, it's very important that whatever we think of, feel in our body, our hearts, or our minds, is that eventually you cap it with the ethical. <laughs> uh, that you cap it eventually with an ethical position. The ultimate responsibility of the theater is to be moral, is to be a moral guide for the human race. And so I, I really think it's important that you inspire people with the right feeling toward everybody else. Now, I, I, I support our culture, uh, the Mayan culture, because it's America, because it's been ignored, because it hasn't been dealt with. It doesn't mean that it's superior to anything. I believe in Asia, the Asian cultures for me. The European cultures, they're there. The very heart of Christianity is the heart that the Mayans were talking about. Africa, the heart of Africa. Uh, it, it, China and Asia, all, all of these are the same expression of this universal truth. Just the way that the body is the same, regardless of race and color of skin, we, we execute the same movements. And so what, I, what is true about Mayan culture is, is what's true behind ballet and behind martial arts, only it has not been reactivated so that it makes sense. And that is part of the mission of the future, is to continue to actualize not just Chicano theater, but American theater in its deepest roots, American theater in its pre-Columbian roots, in its scientific, creative roots. You can read the book. That's, <laughs> that's what we call dropping the knowledge, right? Uh, uh, do not expect me to get up and demonstrate these movements. <laughs> that was uh, some scientific thought and embodiment <laughs> as knowledge making, as per the question. And I'm two years younger. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Huerta, uh -huh. you famously wrote about Chicano theater being necessary theater. How does Chicanex? Latinx theater continue to be necessary today in 2022. We're getting some we're getting some insights into that. For whom? What do you think that Chicanx Latinx theater has to offer theater making and art making in the Americas in general? In other words, what does this work continue to do for new generations of Chicanx Latinx folks? And also, why should people who may not identify as Chicanx Latinx care about these stories and how they are told? Okay, the first part was, <laughs> <laughs> I warned her, I, said, I think there's a lot of parts yeah, of that question. Yeah, I, yes, I always get in trouble. Uh, uh, why is it necessary today in 2022? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I love the term necessary theater because I do, I believe necessary theater. If we don't do theater that is necessary, why are we doing theater? Are we doing unnecessary theater? Are we doing stupid theater, are we, are we doing meaningless, all of the negatives, okay? And we have all seen bad theater. We've all walked out of a play or a movie and not remembered what it was about, right? That's unnecessary. We want you to walk out of that theater knowing exactly what you heard, exactly what you saw, what you felt, and take it home. In the 30s, there was a lot of political theater uh, in, in the American theater, and we were having our own in our villages and what have you, but. The, there was a play on Broadway called Waiting for Lefty by Clifford Odets, a great, great uh, leftist playwright of all that generation of wonderful people writing about the people. But back then, okay, so go to the history books. And they, it ended, was about a union and a strike, and, and it ended with the audience yelling, strike, strike, strike. They were in favor of the strike, and they walk out onto the streets of Broadway. You know, how far does that strike go when you walk out to the streets of Broadway? We were saying, and he said it a long time ago, si el pueblo no va al teatro, if the people don't go to the theater, el teatro tiene que ir al pueblo. Theater has to go to the people. That's necessary theater. Good. <laughs> Could somebody tell me the time? Actually, I... I <laughs> Gave my mother it's before. Friday, I think. 4 54. Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll stop, I will stop. <laughs> never stop, never stop. Um, can you share with us something about, um, well, I, so when you are as prolific and as talented as you both are, people often identify you by your most famous works, 
without knowing as much about your other projects. Can you share with us something about your work in the past decade or two? How has your perspective changed and how has it remained the same? Are you still asking the same questions or are they different? What continues to motivate and inspire you? you answer any part of that. Well, the same things continue. Uh, I have uh, some journals, you know, that I wrote when I was in college. I was 20 years old, and uh, this is for all you 20-year-old students. Uh, I still agree with myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, wrote, I wrote stuff that, that inspired me then. It were hopes and dreams but I still hope and dream the same things, you know. I, I've learned a lot more about how to get things done or how not to get things done. You know, we, you do have to pace yourself. Uh, it, uh, we all age, you know, regardless of what we, how we look. You know, you, it, it, life changes. Um, but the fact is that it depends on, on the size of your dream. And my dream has, has always been continental size you know it's been it's been continent size as big as the americas uh, i saw that and that was a limitation i knew there was a world out there but but i really just wanted to do something to to help my people and then anybody really that they're all my people uh understand where they were and and how things are and there's a lot of ignorance in the world today and unfortunately the technologies that we have uh, social media particularly have made things worse rather than better. You know, better in so many ways. Uh, our life is a lot easier, but it's also a lot harder because lies and distortions. You know, people speak with forked tongues, and they do so deliberately. I, I think that this information, disinformation, mm -hmm. is, is an evil in the world because people do it deliberately, and countries do this deliberately. And, and I think we have to find collectively a way to distinguish between lies and truth. I don't know how to do that, except perhaps through the arts, that sometimes you know when something is true. And when you see a work of art, you say there's truth here that I can relate to. We need more art, and we need more collective art as we go along. Uh, I, I, I participated in show business because it's a reality, and I, I haven't minded the, the advantages you can get by succeeding in show business, but it also gets in the way because it, it commercializes things. And I did never wanted to become a commodity in Hollywood or anywhere, you know? And I withdrew from that because I figured that if I'd stayed any longer, I would become a commodity. So uh, I needed to go back to my origins. That's why I'm still in San Juan Bautista, you know, with my family and, and in our packing shed playhouse. It keeps me humble, and that's good, because I need that. Uh, I, 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 but the fact is that what we're about is communicating with people, and I'm anxious to get back on the boards now that we're hopefully past pandemic and doing more stuff. I, uh, I wrote Valley of the Heart as, as a play from the, from the little packing shed, and it made it all the way to the taper and had a great run. And now it's a screenplay and may become a film, you know. Uh, but uh, the fact is that it's important to start at the root, and start at the humble root. And, and one of the reasons that El Teatro Campesino has been able to survive for 50-some years now, 57 years, is because we're like the grass. And when the wind is blowing, or when the rain is hitting, and the lightning is coming down, we bend like the grass, you know, we're, 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 we're like the sacate. Sometimes if you get too big, you can get blown away, you know. There's nothing wrong with big institutions. Uh, God bless the fact that there are universities like, like this one. Uh, but arts institutions have a very special role to play. First, they have to survive, despite all of the obstacles, and then they have to continue to do what they set out to do, which is to touch people's hearts and increase consciousness wherever they go. Well, sir, <clears throat> if I don't get to ask the question, cuando se me ocurre, se me va la onda. Do you understand that? <laughs> I forget what I wanted to say, but I didn't forget. You said countries, countries. 
you implied that the countries had evil. It's not the countries, it's the leaders, it's the corporations, it's the military, well, it's the, the hegemon, the governments, yeah. and, the, and the despots, That's and the true. dictators. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Not a country, this country is yeah, not it's evil. It's fucking Putin, you know, come on, let's yeah. 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 <laughs> So that's all I want. No, but then also, you, could you repeat some of that? Because there were other parts Just of the question. Just what have you been? What have you been up to? What, oh. what are you still asking the same questions? And what continues to motivate and inspire you? Yeah, usually I'm the interviewer. I get to answer, ask the questions, <laughs> and and I love asking this man questions. And and I have questions for Luis relative to that because I want them to know what else you've been doing, uh, as a scholar. Because I stopped. You know when I when I. Uh, I call it when I graduated, when I retired <laughs> in 09, um, we went to LA and I taught a couple of classes. Well, every year I would teach a class at Occidental College in Latinx theater and whatever, and then I ended up di directing a play for them, a Chicano, an old Chicano play, and it killed me. It was, dis it's, it was exhausting. I couldn't do it again. So I said, okay, you're not going to direct. And, and I've all told everybody, you want to die in your highest moment. I want to die in the middle of my class when I'm really wonderful and strong. <laughs> That's a way to go. Or directing a play in the rehearsal hall. That's wonderful, baby, and you're down, you know? <laughs> I mean, don't you think? And so, all right, now I'm going to have to die while I'm typing away at my next writing, okay? I have been writing introductions. I've been writing uh, forewords to new books coming from the new generation of scholars, including this one and other people uh, on Latinx actor training, on uh, Chicanx identities as expressed by the scholars that are out there. And so I'm mentoring. You never stop mentoring. Uh, and anybody here who is a student of Jade's or a student of Robert's, I am your grandfather. You're my grandchild. <laughs> So you can, <laughs> okay, so you can call me Abuelito, but I will not lend you the car keys, okay? I must say, you know, <laughs> that I uh, acknowledge the creative, lifelong friendship that Jorge and I have had. I knew him when he was a graduate student, you know, he and Ginger, and I slept in their home, in their children's room at the University of Santa Barbara, and I'll never forget that, but I immediately learned, I mean, that he was a PhD student, and I said, perfect. We need the scholarly mind. We need somebody with that objective point of view that can help us to untangle, you know, the puzzle of reality. And, and so immediately I said, this is a colleague, uh, you know, that I want to stay in touch with for the rest of my life. <laughs> and it's been that way. He's been supportive. He's never been judgmental of anybody that I've known. He's a scholar. You know, he, it's all good. They say, if, if, if you're a botanist, you know, there's no weed. If, if you're a chemist, there's no poison. If you're a director, I mean, it's all good, you know. If you're a scholar, it's all interesting. You, 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 you don't take sides you, with a lie. You know, you, you go for the truth. And so I appreciate that, Jorge, very <laughs> much. And I acknowledge that as often as I can. We need more Jorge Huertas, okay, because... Yeah, yeah. This Jorge Huerta and this Luis Valdez are going to wear out, you know, <laughs> sooner rather than later. So no, no, all no, of no. you that are out there and in school and considering what to do with your lives, devote yourself to the study of the human mind and the human heart and the human body and the human history in, in the way that Jorge has done because he's contributed uh, more than I can ever thank him for. He sent people to the Teatro Campesino, associate artistic directors, actors, you know, playwrights. It's been a wonderful collaboration. You should be so lucky. You should be so fortunate as to find a fellow friend, a fellow scholar to enhance your life as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that performing and theorizing social change. That's yeah. what I'm going to call that. Um, and this is my final question, and then we'll open it up to you. Yeah. This is, um, again, digging into your memory bank. As treasured elders, you have each been trailblazers in your own right. In the worlds that we've talked about, you have seen and experienced things that my generation and those younger than me will simply never know, never have to know. We also know that in terms of progress, many things have improved while others have stayed the same or gotten worse. We see that in terms of how workers are treated, the militarization of our borders, and so many other inequities. 
And yet, if you think back on that time when El Teatro Campesino was first coalescing into a project, maybe the circus, the Bailey Circus, <laughs> when you were first documenting the burgeoning Chicano theater movement, what do you miss from those days? Is there something you wish for us to know or remember? Yeah, um, it's a really, when you come to, to our stage in life, people keep asking you, tell us about it. You know, what is it like having documented Chicano theater and written about it, done it for 50 some years, my God. Uh, <laughs> it's about memory, right? And, and what goes first? La memoria. So I, in, in, in writing these, these intros, I'm going back in time and looking at what I wrote a long time ago. Uh, I liked what I, just like you, I, I, read, <laughs> I read my first book to find out what did I say in 1980 about Chicano theater at the time, and it was so different, right? And uh, what, what I miss is the, we have a so, we now have a virtual community. I mean, we could not have, none of us could have survived the pandemic without Zoom, you know, without that horrible technology, but it, it kept us together. One of the highlights of this period of Zoom was getting to, every Friday, we Zoomed, Luis, and his sons, our editor, uh, his editor, Michael Chemers, and myself to talk about the book and to develop every Friday. That was my, that was Christmas, that was church. It was so wonderful. Mm. I mean, the highlight, you know? But to have all those hours with this guy, you know, it was really, really amazing and very useful because I have to keep writing about him and so I need to remember what he did. But nonetheless, there was, this, there was a much more, this, the community we had in the 60s and 70s was very young, very brazen, very political, uh, we ended up fighting each other, uh, a lot of, of people. They wrote a wonderful acto, the Actos of Luis Valdez uh, and the Teatro Campesino, published in 1971 and re-edited, uh, reissued later, uh, Los Militants. Do any of you know that acto, The Militants? It's, it's really a spectacular acto. It was very brief, but they had been, I think it already started, it's Fresno State or no sé qué, but it was about these Chicano, this, this professor, Bolio, comes on and says, tonight we're going to have a special event. We're going to have a Chicano, a real Chicano, come and talk to us. In watch, uh, walks a young man with Chicano number one on him. He says, oh, good, are you ready to speak? And then number two comes on. He says, oh, we have two. Well, we'll let you both speak. And the two speak for about 60 seconds about who is more Chicano than I am. I'm more Chicano because I tengo el bigote. No, 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 I'm more Chicano because I wear the huaraches. And on and on until they shoot each other. They kill each other. It was an incredible metaphor for what we were doing, okay? I don't see that so much anymore. I think what, what I don't miss is the divide and conquer that we lived through back then. Because we were, we were following the rules. We were doing what the man wanted us to do, and that was distracted. We were distracted, and that's what you all, as young scholars and artists, all of us have to stop being distracted. Focus, that's what this book is all about. It's about focus. I would literally do exercises that are in that book at my desk as I'm trying to, to it took a lot to write the introduction. It's really good mm. to write the introduction <laughs> because it tells you about other things that, he, that you don't know about, which I also wanted to ask you about. But anyway, am I answering your question? Absolutely, absolutely. Those are beautiful memories and lessons. I think, I mean, well, it's interesting you referred to that period of dissolution, you know. Because I'm thinking the period before that, just before that, when the teatro and the Chicano movement came together, it was, it was almost by natural momentum that students came together in a period of months, you know, in 68. And suddenly we had a Chicano movement happening, right, where there hadn't been one. In 67, uh, we didn't really separate from the union. We backed off from the union so that we could speak about the war in Vietnam and without losing our focus on the United Farm Workers, we remain supporters, we're still supporters. But uh, the fact is that uh, it, it, moving 60 miles north of Delano to Del Rey uh, put us into uh, a fever, a creative fever of sorts. We were starving actually, we were living off of Papas and Chile. Uh, and the Campesino family was feeding us uh, because we weren't making any money, but, but, and we'd lost the, the strike support. So, uh, but we were creative, man. We were so creative because things were moving so quickly. You know, the students were beginning to organize in the, in the universities. There were Cinco de Mayo uh, celebrations and they needed performances and they needed music. And suddenly there are other teatros being formed. It was wonderful, you know, for a couple of years. It, 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 was, it reached a high point. 
you know, these movements come and go, but it, it, I, I'm in the book, I mentioned about the wave principle. You gotta understand that. That when the, the Spanish arrived, they saw all these serpents on the walls and they said, uh, they're worshiping the devil. That's not it. A snake is the embodiment of the wave principle. That's all. In nature, a snake is a worm is the embodiment of the wave principle, which we all live by. Again, the Fibonacci numbers again. But the thing is that, that the waves in human history, the waves in human behavior come and go. And, and you've got to know where the high points are and where the low points are. But it keeps moving. It keeps moving. I personally think that we're about to enter another high point. It comes post-pandemic. If we can just get past the slaughter of Ukraine, mm. or maybe because of the slaughter of Ukraine, uh, and, and avoid a world war, uh, we'll reach a, a new high point in human communication. Maybe social media will do what it's supposed to do. But people have to hold up the moral torch. They have to say, I can't lie, and I can't stand by while other people are getting raped and killed in front of my eyes every night which is what's happening in, U in Ukraine. And, and I hadn't thought much about Ukraine in my life, but, but uh, I saw Battleship Potemkin. You know, I don't know if you know that movie. It's a classic. That's uh, the steps uh, on the Odessa steps are the classic movie scene, you know? Uh, uh, Eisenstein. Uh, well, uh, Odessa is in Ukraine. You know, mm. funny reality. You know, it's not Russia. It's, it's Ukraine. Mm. And... I, I'm, these days I'm feeling very Ukrainian, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Those nationalities don't mean shit. They're human beings. And so we need to get to the point where, because we are a global culture now, where we begin to practice that. And I'm thinking that, that in, in going back to the image of San Juan Teotihuacan, that you gotta understand that they had ceremonies there involving 20,000 people. Their theater was not a theater of the box. Their theater was not a theater of just stand-up comedy. They actualized the collective, not for human sacrifice. They actualized the collective because they wanted to feel together. And so you can conceive of 20,000 people exercising dance movements together on all of those pyramids. You kind of begin to get the idea of the transcendent quality of theater in ancient America. And we can do that. There have been events now where people hold hands across the whole United States. That's theater. <laughs> it was like the march to Sacramento for me was theater. We marched on Highway 99, which had been an oppressive force, but there we are with the trucks squeezing by, but we had the power to march with our red flags, our eagle flags, uh, to Sacramento. That was theater to me, but it was collective theater. And we need to get back to that when we do that again. Not demonstrations for their own sake, not demonstrations for their, their posturing. It was, it was always ego, you know. <laughs> but demonstrations for the sake of the collective unity, okay? Black lives matter, white lives matter, red lives matter, yellow lives, all, uh, mix the colors you want, brown lives. Brown lives matter. <laughs> it's human life matters, all life matters. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to celebrate that in a new global concept of theater. It's in the book. I talk about it at the end. The need for us to reinvent theater for our time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Muchisima gracias. We would now like to invite you all to anyone who has a question. There's a microphone over here to come up and um, ask us a question, or one over here as well even as you reflect on all of that was just gifted to us. <laughs> First of all, I wanna thank you for all of the wisdom and the knowledge that you shared with us today. And my mentor, uh, Mas and my maestro and my elder for bringing me here today. It's inspiring. It's, uh, it's things that I have been contemplating about. Um, you know, my familia is campesinos, and uh, visiting them uh, during Christmas time, I was really grappling, you know, as a, as a Chicano, right? We become so socially aware that sometimes we focus so much on that pain and, and the anger that comes with it, right? And the social injustice. And I've been grappling a lot with the, with the word carrilla, right? 
and, and what it means when we're in a setting of oppression. Um, and, and you just enlightened me and rekindled that relationship with that word because I, I am able to understand why we do carrilla, right? Why we laugh through the pain, why it brings so much joy in our families. And, and my question to you is, my background is, is in counseling and, and I, I see the connection with the sciences, right? And, and I wonder how are you able to bridge, you know, our ancestral um, being with mental health, right? And what does that healing look like? Um, because it is, goes, does go hand in hand in my, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It's very important, very important. I think you, did I lose it? Did you, d am I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think you talk about that, the whole notion mental of health. mental health, it's in the book, it's in there, no? I mean, it's yeah, about yeah, all health. It deals, it deals with mental health, it's, it's um, in the mind section. Uh, it, it starts with consciousness, you know, the monkey, Chuen, Ebb, which is paradox, dealing with paradox, learning how to, first you gotta know you're conscious, that's Chuen. Ebb is paradox, you gotta know that life is paradoxical, so it's, it's there. It, it, for every negative there's a positive, for every positive there's a negative. You can turn any negative into a positive, you gotta know that. Kids gotta know that. And, and I, I turned uh, the negatives in my life into positives, you know, I, I made them creative. The fact that Mexicans were, de were despised in certain circles, suddenly for me is a treasure. The fact that there was no Chicano theater opened up the whole field. I could write about anything, you know? <laughs> and, and so it's, these are opportunities. Uh, so it's, it's Chuen Eben, Ben is language. It, it's learning the spirit of language and how, how to express yourself. You know, an eek, which is, which is, Ben Ish, I mean, I-X, is the real interesting one. That's the sign of the jaguar night sun, which is the subconscious. Mm. Being able to go into your subconscious, actors have to do this because mm -hmm. not everything is in the text. You gotta do the subtext as well. Mm -hmm. But in life, you have to learn what your subconscious is doing. Not be afraid of yourself and, and, you achieve mental health by accepting yourself, by being kind to yourself, not despising yourself. Of course, if you have a lot of people saying you're a burro, uh, that, that's a problem. And you have to overcome that in some way. As for instance, they say that, you know where the word Aztec comes from? The Aztecs, uh, uh, that word was invented by the Spanish because they found the indígenas and it said Azteca, you know. <laughs> The Aztecas, the Azteca. <laughs> because they were Mexicas, they weren't Aztecs, you know. <laughs> but but uh, beyond the ish, the subconscious, you get into men, which is create, to believe, to create, to do. But it's the eagle's son. And we're all touched by the eagle's son. That's your creativity. If you can find some way to play and be creative as a child, you're on your way to healing yourself. Mm -hmm. And so play is very important. You know, I worked in the fields with my parents when I was a kid, but I, and my mind was mine, you know? My hands were busy, but I could dream up all kinds of stuff that I was going to do, and I was always too tired to do it at the end of the day. <laughs> but I kept dreaming, you know? And eventually one day it became true that, that I learned the secret of paper mache and I could make my own masks and puppets, and then I could play, then I could do my stuff. Mental health then deals with, with accepting yourself. Mm. And, and we need to tell ourselves we have the genius of the human race. We're just as smart, no smarter, just as smart. You know, we, we can do math, we can do science, we can become brain surgeons. You know, and, and encourage our people, tell your children that they're brilliant. Asians do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, tell your children they're brilliant. That was a beautiful thing that you did. You know, and, and if they're little and they hear that, it becomes real to them. But if you turn around and you say, Cállate, cabrón, que burro, que sabes tú? I mean, you're just imp imposing the oppression uh, mm -hmm. from somebody else on them. So that's part of mental health, right? Mm -hmm. it's, I believe we have to have cultural centers, folks. We have to have cultural centers in our communities mm -hmm. that keep the spark alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we have any other questions? I like 
I put this outfit on for you today. <laughs> you know he did. You know he did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, I feel like I re something specific in my education that was pivotal for me um, was when I read Pensamiento Serpentino. Mm. Um, and I think it's funny that you even brought it up because I think the serpent, the snake, it comes with such a negative connotation. But when you think about it, how you put it, it's like skin sheds and like things grow and stuff. Um, but I just, I feel like that's one of your pieces that really captures everything for me. It's like all there in just such a poetic way. Um, so I just wanted to pick your mind on it, you know, just when you think back on it, or what is that piece to you or anything, you can just tell me about that piece. It's one of my favorites. About Pensamientos yeah, what's, Serpentino. Where, is your, where was your Pensamientos when you okay, wrote that? I, I, Pensamientos Serpentino comes from the maestro, why maestro Domingo Martinez Paredes. You know, it's, it's his concept. But again, it's talking about the power of the wave, it's power about the serpents. Uh, it's, it's, it means, serpentine thought means that you, you're mathematical, you know, that you are, again, the Fibonacci numbers, the golden mean, uh, your ability to be able to discern these patterns in nature that uh, serpentine thought is embodied in a tree, that a tree spirals. It's the spiral, if you will. And when a snake settles down, it spirals. It's a spiral. A rattlesnake is a spiral, basically, holding, you know? And I've always told people, don't think of me as, as short, think of me as uh, a coiled uh, spring, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, <laughs> with the power, you know? And because that's, that's what the spiral is. Yes, uh, and so uh, the springs in a car, you know, are spirals. Mm. And so that's pensamiento serpentino. Note the universality of this form and how it is that it integrates itself into just about everywhere we look. It's in nature and it's in the weather and it's in human behavior. Uh, I don't think that we understand ourselves as a race, as a, you know, we are one creature. It's called the human race. And if you've ever seen the birds, you know, films of birds flying through the air, and they shift in one direction and in another direction, mm -hmm. or in the sea, the fish in the ocean moving as schools of fish. The human beings are no different. We move that way, and we don't even know when we're moving like that because we think we're individuals. <laughs> we think that we're graced, you know, with the, we're touched by God, just us. <laughs> no man nosotros, not you, you know? And that's bullshit. The fact is <laughs> that, that you have to know who your collective self is. And so, again, Pensamiento Serpentino allows you to help to do that, to understand that. You know, the, the rattlesnake was the symbol of the sun for, for the Maya and, and for indigenous cultures because uh, they embodied uh, the pyramid of, of the square, the diamond is on the back, the diamond rattlesnake, that's the symbol of the sun and Hunabku. And uh, when we did La Bamba, you know, I had uh, the rattlesnake, Richie was wearing a jacket, you know, with a rattlesnake jacket there are rattlesnakes in the movie. And then when Richie goes to see the, uh, the curandero with his brother in the movie, uh, the curandero gives him a collar. You know, it's got the feathers and it's got um, the, the rattles, you know, from the snake. And uh, that's the power of Quetzalcoa that was given to uh, Richie. And I mean, I actualized, I, I actualized a story that's behind that, but I, I made it more literal in terms of the movie. So when Bob rips it off in their fight, he essentially kills his brother, you know, that I wanted to make that, but he had the power of the serpent going for him when he went to New York. And I really believe that. I think Richie uh, Valens uh, was a, a forerunner for all of us. He, what he did, we we're about the same age, but I mean, I remember 1958, you know, I remember when he came out, I, I didn't know he was Chicano until years later, but. But he had the power of the serpent work, not the power of the devil, the power of nature, the power of the sun. That's what that means. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the, in the back and then over here, Daniel. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, my question is, when you're trying to spread things like positivity or optimism, uh, how do you make sure when you're doing that, you're doing it in like a responsible... I'm not picking up everybody. Oh, sorry. You're doing that in like a responsible and like an empathetic matter, uh, manner? Because when I, sometimes when I'm speaking with my friends or other people, um, they might express like some cynicism about politics, the world around them. 
And I'm kind of hard-headed. I will insist that we want to move forward, be optimistic, and, f and think that tomorrow will be better. But I, I sometimes have some self-doubt if I'm doing, saying it in a good way or saying it in a way that's meaningful. Because sometimes, once I even just said, like, I can't accept your cynicism, but I wasn't able to follow that up well. Um, when, you're, when you're spreading a message like that or trying to communicate, how do you, what self-reflection do you do or any strategies you have? So you're doing it in a manner that's well-received, that's sensitive and empathetic. Whenever I come against anything negative, even if it's coming from my own mind, you know, it's a downer, I tell myself, give me a break. <laughs> it's it corta fluido, fluido, which I learned from my mom. It's a spiritual concept. Corta fluido. Cut it. Cut the negative. Don't let it get into your head. Okay? Say no. You know what I mean? I don't accept it. And in terms of anger, uh, actually last night we were discussing this. Uh, uh, my wife and I and my daughter-in-law, Maya, Maya Wave, <laughs> and, and, and Lakin, uh, that um, I learned this from Emilio Scarraga, actually the founder of uh, Telemundo. Uh, a saying, it says, el que se enoja pierde. Mm -hmm. Don't get angry because you lose. Keep your cool, in other words. I understand righteous anger, and I've been angry many, uh, you know, I, I used to have a b big ball of anger in my chest. And it was my mom, God bless her, because she was a spiritual counselor that got me to get rid of it. And, and I still have a spiritual practice, uh, which I use in order to get rid of the anger, that ball of anger that I used to have when I was a young man, uh, because it was killing me, basically. I was too angry, too damn angry. You know, I was going to do damage to myself. And, and it's all right to have righteous anger, but channel it, man. Get it somewhere else, right? Let it go somewhere else. Because, uh, like the saying goes, el que se enoja pierde. Mm -hmm. Whoever gets angry loses. Stay cool. Keep your cool. Keep your mentality straight and, and creative, okay? Could I, could I also yeah, and, uh, interject, speaking of our mothers, who were both very spiritual, my mother is a Protestant Mexican, can you imagine? And, uh, <laughs> and his mother is as a Roman Catholic with an indigena philosophy that was wonderful to, to learn from. My mother would always tell me, consider the source. It's real basic, consider the source. Forgive them or, or understand, you know, you say that, that the friend is cynical. Yeah, the cynicism is hard to get hold. It's very difficult because he's distracted. He or she are distracted. It's the distractions, that I'm convinced that it's all about distraction. That'll be the title of my next book, Distractions. <laughs> And I'm famous for distracting myself. And so we have to be very, very cautious of who is saying what and why are they saying that. In a way, it's saying forgive them, you know. I want to go back to In La I, I found it most interesting and disgusting that there's this move. They banned uh, In La Queche, which comes out of Pensamiento Serpentino and everything else that you have written about. They banned it because it was, it was some kind of, in the schools. You've heard, I don't know if any of you have not seen that. In San Diego. In San, only in San Diego? No, it was driven by, it was taken up, but it was driven by a local effort. Well, nobody banned my book, <laughs> which is something. I mean, I want my book to be banned because if more people will buy it. <laughs> no. No, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be, be uh, I am being silly, but the idea of In La Quiche is so beautiful. Vigan. Tu eres mi otro yo. Si te hago y te respeto a ti, te amo y te respeto, me amo y me respeto yo. Si te hago daño a ti, me hago daño a mí. Uh, you are my other me. If I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. And, and... Again, what we're up against, you've got to remember, there's a world out there that for the last 500 years <laughs> has believed that we descend from cannibals, headhunters, and, and human sacrifice, uh, you know, the, the hearts. Uh, we, we cut hearts out. That has come up consistently. It came up in the Sleepy Lagoon case in court. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's come up to this day that you can't trust Mexicans because, you know, they'll... they'll start sacrifice. And I think it was come up with Zin Lakesh. They said it was Aztec religion. And so the next thing you know, we'll, we'll start cutting out hearts. And, and that, that's uh, okay. And so Jesus Christ was a killer, right? I mean, it, it, Jesus Christ was a, an asshole killer. Uh, I mean, that's basically what it amounts to. Because we're talking about something much more basic and much more human and much more, uh, in, in, you know, central to everything. Uh, but 
we're up against that, and it's up to the scholars again to begin to question that. It's furiously, and, and it's up to uh, people in our communities to fight against that in terms of the injustices that we're trying to overcome. But, it, but above all, it's up to the artists to create new images. Don't be overtaken by the, by the lie, you know? And uh, again, the humor. I'll never forget that um, Felipe Cantu, you know, he was a snake man in, in La Bamba, but he was one of the original members of the Teatro Campesino in Delano. Uh, we pulled him out of the fields, actually. He was brilliant. He was a genius. He was amazing. But he used to keep us laughing, man, because he would do uh, an old man, two old men. This was his routine by himself. Two viejitos standing up and saying, Caete, hijo de tu chingada madre! You know, and, then, and, then, and fighting. And he would do the movements. I can't do Felipe Cantu. But he, <laughs> he would do both characters... And he would just break us up, man, because it's so ridiculous to think of old people having that kind of fury, you know, because you, 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 you get tired after a while. You're too tired to be angry, <laughs> you know? But young men do that because young men fall into the anger trap because it's there. So young men have to be cool, and they have to get old before their time in that respect and settle down, you know what I mean, and channel that anger. And, and uh, it's amazing to me that uh, the president of Ukraine, you know, Zelensky, has not expressed anger, yeah. that he's, so, he's a comedian. You know, these signs catch, uh, mas, mas claro no canta un gallo. I mean, he is showing the world what it is to fight for your life. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's not a six-footer. He's not a big brawling football player, you know. He's, 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 he's just a little Ukrainian who turned out to be a giant. It's amazing. <laughs> And, and so it's important then that, that we keep our minds so that we don't lose our souls, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll be handing confession out after this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> our last question, Daniel, welcome. And then please don't um, join us for the book signing and the reception afterwards. Um, hello. Um, First of all, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to just be in your presence. I'm going to go home and cry because I just feel so <laughs> overwhelmed with everything and the knowledge. I feel so inspired. Um, I have recently picked up on playwriting, and um, so I, it's a two-part question. So um, the first one, when you get inspired by something, how do you start a new piece? What do you do? What is the, just what form do you take? And second part, I recently just produced my own um, play, with my co-director. Oh, he left. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, uh, he's working. Um, and one of my biggest challenges of doing that was, um, uh, it's centered around a Latinx Mexican family. One of my biggest challenges was I didn't want to stereotype my community. And you just recently said creating new images. And it's probably the first time someone is seeing a Latinx play or seeing something about my community, and it was specifically centered around immigration and a first-generation child not understanding the mother's um, like battles of immigration. And so I was Beautiful just... play. <laughs> thank you. And, um, <laughs> and uh, one of my biggest fears is just like um, generalizing, stereotyping my community. So as a Chicano playwright, how do you battle the forces of creating a new image and becoming a and creating a new face for our community while not supporting these negative stereotypes? Well, that's a real good question, uh, <laughs> but it goes straight to my first play, first full-length play. It's called The Shrunken Head of Pancho Villa. I love that play. Okay. I love it so much. <laughs> I, I realized that what I was up against is stereotypes, mm -hmm. and so my response was, since I was dealing with a poor family, which was mine, you know, in the 50s, uh, I decided to go straight into it and blow it up by going into it. In other words, it's a theater, the absurd piece. It's got, uh, uh, the oldest son is a bodiless head, right? And yeah. he eats a lot of beans and farts and, you know, <laughs> and I mean, this was in 1964, 65 that we did this. Uh, with, all, with a non-Chicano cast, by the way, they were all Anglos. Uh, the, the one guy that, that looked brown was a Palestinian, actually. Dawood uh, Ishmaeli, but he was funny, you know, he, he, did, it, he did a Chicano. But the, the thing is that I was faced with the need to be able to explode stereotypes. And that was what I did. I loaded it so heavily 
into this play that it's, uh, it's, it's what I call a cosmic comedy. You know, it just it, it attempts to blow the stereotypes. Uh, whether it succeeds remains to be seen, but it's funny if you do it right uh, because it's humor that's going to get you out of there. Uh, at the same time, uh, I don't expect that every play needs to do that. You know, once we have cleared the water, then, then we go to another level. But, but uh, humor is always important in one way or another. And uh, it's always important to look at something from a different point of view. Immigration is a constant concern of ours. But it's been going on for a long time, you know. We, we, we immigrated here a long time ago. And, and we're part of another wave and another wave and another wave. And somehow people say, oh, you just got here, you know. But no, we were, we were here first, you know. Because we're also Indios. And so we were here, uh, you know, we were here with the Kumiai. They're our second cousins, you know. Mm -hmm. As a matter of for me, as a Yaki, uh, they're right there next door, you know. And so uh, when I saw the Yaki Easter ceremony, I realized something about the humor of, mm -hmm. of, of my ancient people, my people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, the, it's the passion play put together a long time ago, but I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a lovely thing to see because it's powerful. It's, it's a religious ceremony, but it's funny. And, and uh, they do it every year. It's a sacrifice. It's a don, you know. It, it, it's, it's something that they do as, as a, uh, to do penance the actors. But in any case, that the, perhaps doing the shrunken head is penance too of a way, you know, for an actor to get in there. But you got to blow up your own stereotypes before you get to the, under, the layer underneath. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. <laughs> My mom's from Sonora, so yakis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sonora. Yeah. Okay. I think we're done. Yes. Gracias. Thank you. A final round of applause for our, our beautiful speakers. Right. For all of you who came out, for all the folks online, for all our sponsors, for the families here, for the partners that have, that have been accompanying these, these maestros their whole lives. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And for all our generations, and may we take what we got today and pass it forward. So thank you so much. Outside, right? We have the books outside. We have some books signing. We have limited copies of the books. If you don't get one, we have an order form that we can request it to you, who you want it to be autographed to so that it will still be autographed. And we have food from Tuetano Taqueria, the burritos that the señora makes are really good. Okay. okay. <laughs> have a good night. In la kitch. In la kitch. Ladies and gentlemen, the mono you're about to see is a construct of fact and fantasy. But relax. Weigh the fact.